and that is starting right now. So welcome everybody for joining us on the chat for July 2nd as we head into the 4th of July weekend. Um, I want to welcome Dr. Mike Morris from the Amherst Public Schools today, joining myself and your town manager, Paul Bachelman. Um, before we launch into Q&A from the folks in the room and some um, questions that were sent to us, I want to give Paul a chance to offer any updates he might have. Sure. So um, two things, major things happened this week. Um, first is I presented the budget to the town council on Monday, and that launched a series of meetings with the finance committee on every Tuesday and Thursday for the next couple of weeks, and then a public hearing on July 13th uh, in front of the town council. Uh, and on Tuesday, the superintendent and the library director reviewed their budgets with the finance committee, and we'll sequentially go through every department. Uh, and these meetings are at 2.30 in the afternoon, so you're welcome to join all on Zoom. Uh, the second thing that came out this week was the University of Massachusetts um, at Amherst. It released its um, plan for uh, returning in the in August, actually, and um, with, a, with opening up a lot of their dorms and um, having one out of seven classes being on campus, the rest of them uh, being uh, remote or, or online. So, um, so we were in conversations with them about the impact that will have on the town, our concerns and um, a, a sort of a healthy dialogue along those lines. Great, thank you for those updates. And I just wanna remind everybody in the room to ask your question. You can use the Q&A function in Zoom, or you can raise your hand from Zoom and ask your question live in the room. Um, if you're joining from a phone, just press star nine to raise your hand. Mike, any general updates you wanna give us before we launch into questions? Um, you know, I think the, um... It's funny, school year ended. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, but it, it's, a, it's a soft end for, for many people because it didn't involve physically being in school. And I think that's, for, for, for many of us, that's our vision of what school year end means. Um, I wanna thank our principals for doing fabulous jobs ending the school year and our staff uh, with graduation ceremonies, virtual graduations um, that were done um, in ways that were incredibly inclusive and some in-person opportunities, for instance, Wildwood and some of the other schools had some staggered on-site pieces where students could at least be um, at the school site um, and see their teachers uh, on their last day of school or the last week of school. So um, that was only two weeks ago, so not too, not too long, two weeks ago today, actually. Uh, but uh, this is not a summer like any other, and that's true for the town as well as the schools. And uh, in the time since then, we've received the initial draft guidance from the state, although uh, a much more complete guidance is expected in the next two or three weeks uh, about return to school. We've had multiple school committee meetings. We've basically been meeting, meeting uh, just about every week, um, this being an exception, this week being an exception, but our school committee has taken a um, very clear stand um, that they want the administration to Start, be, start drafting up scenarios and space uh, summaries based on having the CDC guidelines of six feet between students. And so we've been working on that. And next week, uh, next Tuesday, we'll have a joint school committee meeting between the Pelham, Amherst, and regional school committees, where we'll, go, given, we'll be able to offer a pretty detailed update on space. We'll show some maps about where students fit and don't fit. Uh, so people can get a visual sense of, of what this looks or could look like. Um, we're also going to do an update based on distance learning surveys. Uh, we'll do a summary and analysis of those that occurred in the spring from family, students, and staff. And, and perhaps most importantly, the school committee is going to be starting to consider priorities for the administration. So really help driving what plans uh, get developed. So they'll be talking about that on Tuesday night at the school committee meeting. There are two town halls, which we'll probably talk about a little later on Thursday to solicit input from uh, both elementary and secondary stakeholders and then hopefully voted the, the following week on the 14th so that we can then, we being the, the staff, can respond with models that conform to the priorities that the school committee sets. So uh, all this is happening in real time. You know, something that people will hear me say a lot is there's four operational areas we're talking a lot about. One is maintenance, cleaning uh, as it relates to safety, uh, transportation, staffing, and then space. And so in addition to the instructional, the incredibly important instructional work that's happening, we are thinking a tremendous amount about logistics uh, because if we don't get the logistics right, the learning can't happen. And, and so that's sort of the work that we're doing on an ongoing basis. Uh, when it's challenging work, but it's also, there's pieces that are exciting. We're, we're doing problem solving every single day. And uh, so intellectually, uh, high stimulation and also uh, problems that we haven't had to solve before that we're working on. 
And it's, it's been really been through the teamwork that we have. I think the last thing I'll note, uh, and maybe I'll send it to Brianna so we can put it in the chat or make it publicly, is we have opened a fall 2020 planning website. It's located on our website. So the idea is that it's continually updated with you know, survey results, presentations made at school committee, and we're trying to do one-stop shopping for everyone uh, who uh, wants to find information from the district about that. And so that'll be updated on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then when we actually get to plans, you'll have that. We have our guiding principles that our staff worked incredibly hard on um, and primarily teaching staff worked in, uh, incredibly hard on at the end of the year. So you can see what our guiding principles are, for instance, for distance learning at elementary and secondary levels, if we have to rely on it next year around operation, space, food service, all of those pieces. And they really are wonderful guiding principles that as we come up with a plan, we'll work to implement those principles in action. And I Great, think that's thank you. probably enough talking from me for a second. So uh, sorry about that, Brianna. Oh, no, that's perfect. And we will get that um, link out when we share the copy of the video. So we'll put it out on our Facebook and our Twitter um, channels. And we'll also note it into the recording itself so people can get, have access to that. So it looks like we just got a question in, a couple questions in from the, the room. Um, is ARPS leaning toward one of the two models presented to parents in the surveys at this point? I wouldn't say that we're leaning in any direction. And that's really where the school committee priorities will set the, the way that we'll lead. Uh, what we're doing uh, after this school committee identified six feet, six feet between students to be the um, Kind of the space piece what we did is a space analysis and also a transportation analysis uh, that we're presenting back um, and the school committee will lead the way on kind of what priorities for in-person versus distance learning we can have once those variables are known which we'll present on tuesday so that might be a, a good point to um, you, you mentioned a little bit in your opening um, statement there about the process and how people can offer feedback um, and some of the upcoming events that are going to be taking place to do so. Do you wanna um, dig into that a little bit right now, Mike? Sure, so um, we have uh, a couple of ways. One is that the school committee would always remind me and I wanna make sure that I share this, that uh, anyone can offer feedback to me, morrism at arps.org, but the school committee directly is school committee, one word, at arps.org. And, and that's a really good way for uh, feedback to be offered. Uh, I think, more intentionally, there's uh, two town halls on Thursday, so a week from today. Uh, on the 9th, there's one uh, that's more focused on an elementary level, and that's at noon, uh, and it'll be on a YouTube, so very accessible for everybody. If you have, you know, the link is, is on our website, uh, it's on our social media accounts, it was emailed out to all, all staff and families, and uh, that way questions come in through the text and it can be answered. There's also some presentation component that I think the school committee may, will make on their initial thoughts on priorities. The same, same thing will occur at five o'clock in the afternoon, and that one's more focused on the seven through 12 students on the secondary students. But uh, the model the school committee laid out is they're gonna have a discussion about and deliberate uh, about some draft priorities that they would like to provide to the staff on Tuesday the 7th, get feedback on the 9th in those two sessions, and then you know through email and other mechanisms, and then hopefully make a decision on the 14th. We'll see if they're able to do that or they need more time. Uh, but it really is, uh, once we have the, the space and those variables are sorted, uh, they wanna come up with what the priorities are, get feedback from the community and then move forward so that we at the staff level can then uh, provide real options based on the feedback we receive from the community via the school committee. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that just came in from the room um, from Mike, have you reviewed the recent guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which recommends that children return to school what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so we have seen that. I thought it was a very thoughtful document that they put out. Um, I think there's multiple factors here where you have uh, competing state agencies or federal agencies offering, or in this case, uh, private agencies, offering really different advice. Uh, what I heard from the school committee was real clarity that the CDC are um, the government's best mechanism to talk about disease control, and we're in a pandemic. And the guidance I received from the school committee is, this is a public health issue. And, and I understand what uh, the pediatrics saying, it's a public health issue if students don't return as well. And I think both things can be true. Um, what uh, I'll say personally for me, one of the things about uh, three versus six feet is also about the quarantine rules. So, um, and this is playing out, it was just a case in, in California that this uh, sort of played out in, in a, in a non-school setting, but 
to be distance means six feet. And so uh, if a student return is less than six feet um, away from another student and has COVID-like symptoms, uh, then that other student would need to also be quarantined. And so, you know, how often does a student have COVID symptoms in school, right? Once COVID symptoms are fever, coughing, sneezing, we have students every single day in our schools who ha have that. It could be allergies or there's a lot, wide range of reasons. So one of the things the school committee, I think one of the reasons that I, I support the school committee recommendation is it's not just about who we get in school, it's actually keeping them in school, keeping schools open because we know uh, the line I've used multiple times in, in private and public conversations, anytime someone pushes against the guidelines around COVID, COVID wins, right? And, and there's a plethora of examples of that. And so I think from the school committee perspective, they want to make sure the public health guidance drives the education piece. Uh, I think things will become more clear Tuesday night when we've done the space analysis that uh, perhaps, and I, I said this last week at school committee, perhaps more is possible than um, students not returning to school at all at any grade level. Uh, may not get to all kids returning um, back um, five days a week. And that's really for the school committee to weigh in on. Um, so we are reading all reports that come in. I think there were really valid points made in the pediatrician article that, that's being referenced. Um, but the, the uh, guidelines from CDC continue to be our guidelines as it relates to public health. Okay. And we have another question that just came into the room, more speaking to the, more broadly the population in Amherst. Um, and this is coming from Chris. Could Paul comment on the added risk to citizens and students from the arrival of thousands of students from outside of Amherst and their mixing into the local population? Yeah, it's that's been the topic of the week when the uh, when the university revealed its plans on Monday. Um, we have had conversations with uh, Hampshire College, Amherst College, and the university in trying to get a gauge on how many students are coming back, how many will be on campus, how many will be off campus, what are their protocols for testing, uh, surveillance testing, uh, asymptomatic testing, whatever it is, and what are their plans for isolation and quarantine if there is a positive. I don't think, I think we will, uh, there will be an impact on the town. We have serious concerns about the impact on the town on multiple levels. One is the health of the of the popu of our general population, our year-round population. Um, another is recognizing the age group we're talking about. These are young people who have a lot of pent-up energy who haven't seen each other since they were, you know, before spring break, and naturally they are where social animals are going to want to be together. Typically, we have um, parties in the town uh, when college is in session. Um, there will, and, and normally we are able to manage those um, in a pretty successful way. But in this day and age, um, when people probably aren't going to be wearing masks, when they won't be observing social distancing, when they are, might have larger than the 10 people, um, we have deep concerns, plus an environment where um, there's a fair amount of animosity to, towards our police officers. So it's a very complex environment. We've, we're having those conversations with the university and the colleges um, and hope that they will understand the concerns that we have. And even concerns such as um, going to Big Y or CVS. Um, you know, I think we've done a really good job in our town of, of observing social distancing, wearing masks and thing like, things like that. And as long as if students or, or, or anybody coming into town is able to join in, um, is I hope that they will help us to re keep up the good work that we've done. Um, I don't think you can introduce that number of students into a small community like ours without there being some kind of uh, spike of some sort and then how we manage through that because these are decisions that these three institutions have made uh, and we will bear the um, responsibility for managing through them. We've got, we got another question in the room that's related to this um, same concern. So um, a concern about the capacity of our local healthcare system, especially with um, the large influx of students back in our community. Um, they're wondering, can the university and local hospitals handle an outbreak? It's not my impression we're prepared for this. I say this with a lot of empathy for colleges making tough decisions and the students who want their regular college experience. 
Yeah, it's another good. I mean, I, I think Mike and I talk pretty much every day and I see the complex decisions he has to make and his team has to make. Colleges, it's, a, it's an equally complex decision-making process and you're dealing with the sort of economics of higher education and you're dealing with uh, three institutions that have really suffered financially because of the, 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 the free fall from COVID-19. So I, I really do, I, I appreciate that the writer um, identified that. Um, we, you know, we have uh, asked that question specifically about uh, the internal capacity. They are all very aware of what the capacity of our local hospital is. Uh, at the university, they have university health services. They are ramping up a center to talk about public health and that will help sort of be an epicenter area for them to provide testing. Uh, they believe, I, um, I think all three institutions believe that um, proper testing, uh, again, symptomatic, asymptomatic and surveillance testing, which I think is really the key, um, will help them uh, move forward. And another comment from the room that, again, relates to this uh, last thing you just said, will the results of COVID testing of students be shared with the town's health department? Um, yeah, that's if, a, it's a, if they live in Amherst. Yeah. Um, so, so the university is sort of an entity on its own. It's, it's a sovereign, you know, it's a part of the state. They get their test results independently from the, our health department. And our health department is part of the MAVEN system, uh, but there's really close communication between our health department and the, and the health department at the, um, at the university, very, very close. They talk daily, really good, you know, very professional people at both ends. So, um, but the, the university through its system, they get notification of any positive cases faster than the town does actually. And they, they have been sharing any kind of information like that. We're encouraging them to uh, continue that practice and to make sure that it's their entire community, not just the students living on campus, but all staff, um, students and affiliates of the university, uh, if they um, have a connection to the university that they are able to provide the testing. Um, a lot of the stuff is gonna be at the initiative of the, of the university. It's a pretty big expense to do all this testing that they need to do. And they want, they're building, they're trying to build their own capacity in-house to be able to do that. So real credit to them. I think they're taking this very seriously. Um, and it's a big job for them and to ramp up in a really short period of time. So I do see a hand in the room and I'm gonna invite my friend Ken in. So Ken, if you could just unmute and introduce yourself. Thank you, Brianna. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. Uh, I'm the father of a daughter in New Jersey, <clears throat> excuse me, who's an elementary school librarian and her sister in Pennsylvania as an almost six year old who's about to go to kindergarten. So we see the problem from both sides and, and we see two <clears throat> important principles here. One is it's really important to get children back to school. It's so hard to do this from home. The younger they are, the more important it is to get them to school. And the second one is it would be terrible to open the schools and then have a problem and have to close them down again. That would be very, very bad. So we've come up with one very expensive solution for you that nobody will like financially. And I was a college treasurer and I understand these things, but the six foot separation is really hard for little children. And we think one answer may be to more teachers aides in the younger, the classrooms of younger children they don't have to be qualified as teachers. They could probably be young people who are out of work, otherwise out of work, who would come in and just work with the teachers and work with the children in very small groups so that they are separated and, and don't run together at recesses and, and times like that. It's very hard and of course, all of those people would have to quarantine themselves at home so that they don't bring anything back to school. It will cost you some money. Um, I just put that on the table as, as, as a solution we've come up with that doesn't, that isn't economically sound, but it may, it may work. And uh, I think taxpayers like me would be willing to pay a little more if we knew it meant that our kids were A, safe, our teachers were safe, and they were able to go to school. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Ken. And, and um, yeah, so something similar, uh, there's a New York Times article, it's getting a lot of social media attention that, that's focused on particularly having college students or recent college graduates. 
I think the conversation, it's an interesting connection to the conversation and the questions the town managers answered and then uh, also uh, how people feel about their children and going to school. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in conversations, not at the level Paul has, but with UMass in terms of their college of education and what does it mean to have student teachers? And, to, you know, what's the community level's comfort level with having student teachers, not just from the university, but from, we have student teachers from five or six different uh, institutions of higher education, uh, given concerns and given particularly the trends of COVID in other states and age groups, which seem, um, seem like they're going up uh, in higher numbers. Um, so it's an interesting one. I do feel like, um, and this will become a little more clear on Tuesday when we share our kind of space diagrams, we're very fortunate uh, to have a significant number of staff members, both in terms of what we, we our terming would be paraeducators, uh, as well as professional staff in our schools. And how we staff our schools will look really different because one of the pieces in CDC guidance is just a six feet. It's also about keeping the co same cohort together all day. And that's not our typical model. And so I think what you'll find when we don't do that is we have a lot of adults that perhaps aren't typically uh, in classrooms. They're usually pulling students out who, who will be in classrooms. So uh, as the school committee models uh, gives, gives the staff guidance, I think we'll be able to start plugging in the staffing models of what it looks like and seeing if it meets people's comfort level. Because we're doing a significant amount of, uh, frankly, construction at two of our elementary schools, and you talked about elementary schools, Ken, um, we will have um, some pretty large spaces, and this has been shared in public at two of our schools at Fort River and at Wildwood, uh, getting rid of the quads and moving to kind of half spaces. They're 1,900 square foot classrooms. Those are really large uh, and can accommodate a lot of learners. And so I think uh, it's good feedback to think about other creative models. Um, and I do want to note and appreciate the support we do receive from the town of Amherst for running our schools, even on uncertain times. And the more ideas, the better. So keep them coming. And did you have any follow up or are you all set? Okay, I'm going to pull you out of the room then. And I do see that we got a, a hand from Ron. So I'm going to pull you into the room, Ron, if you could um, unmute and introduce yourself, please. Ron, I'm a member of the Pelham School Committee. Mike, I read those uh, letters from the community stressing five days a week. They were compelling, but it still d doesn't answer the question. If the, the vi virus doesn't spread, why are the kids wearing masks? Uh, uh, so it, it, there's an implication in the, the requirement for masks that the virus spreads somewhat. How do you trade off uh, five days a week for the burden that's going to place on working families? What do you do about that? Yep, and I think Ron highlights the tension point uh, that that we're all facing. And again, I you know maybe I should have come on next Thursday, Paul. I apologize, but uh, I think things will become more clear as to what's possible from a space perspective. You know, we're just working. We're pretty much done K to eight. We're working on the high school map uh, and Summit Academy at this point. But I think once we're done with that, it'll become more clear what's possible, what's advisable, what's beneficial, right? That'll be Ron, unfortunately for you, perhaps some of your job and your colleagues uh, to work through. But uh, really the guidance was really helpful about the six feet because we were then able to literally go building to building, put desks in, put out the measuring tape, measure six feet between where students would sit. Uh, we have a couple odd shapes room, Ron, Ron's school in particular has a couple odd shapes rooms up in Pelham. Uh, that, that aren't rectangular uh, or aren't fully rectangular. So we were able to do that. You've got situations at Crocker Farm where there's built in cubbies in the rooms uh, that we can't remove. Um, so we had to account for that. We looked at staggering rows. So we have a lot of data that we're coming back with. And I think that'll help inform the next piece of the conversation about what's possible. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Good to hear from you. All right, thank you, Ron. So again, I know we're having a lot of these details forthcoming, but we do have a question about um, what your thoughts are around busing in the fall and whether or not sports, in-person sports and team sports are a reality in the fall. Yeah, so uh, in terms of busing, that's another uh, data point we'll be presenting on Tuesday night. It might be a long meeting, so you may want to grab some coffee, hot cocoa, cappuccino. I don't, I don't do caffeine, so I don't really know the right words for it, but um, Paul does, he'll know. Um, 
And um, it, we'll have a lot of data to present. Um, you know, we got multiple hundreds of responses around distance learning and we disaggregated it by grade level. So you can see how elementary families, staff uh, responded at secondary family staff and then middle school students and high school students. So we have a lot of data we're presenting on that. We have done an analysis, uh, for instance, our, um, our current school committee policy is that we only would have to provide transportation for students who live a mile and a half or more from school. Our reality, and it's been a reality for a long time, is we transport every single student who wants transportation to our elementary schools. Uh, state law is that it's two miles from the school. So we did an analysis um, of how many students could fit on a bus. And uh, in all three of those models, our current model, if we went down to a mile and a half or further, and we went to two, and a, two miles or further. At the regional level, we have to drive all students because that's the basis of our reimbursement being a regional district. So there's not a lot of wiggle in the region for the secondary student transportation. At the elementary level, our surveying showed that between 30 and 40, actually K to 12, showed between 30 and 40% of families said they would absolutely provide transportation next year, either to help the district or because they felt like it was safer for their child. Uh, a significant other percentage said they, they might be able to do that. So uh, I think transportation is a complex piece of all of this. Um, it's more complex at the elementary level in some ways because the district, the school committee could move to change who gets buses, who doesn't. At the regional level, it's harder, but it's simple because we have to be able to provide transportation for all students. And that'll be a barrier in terms of um, to getting all kids back for five days. Um, so uh, we will talk loosely about that and we'll have some data on Tuesday night. Um, but I, I don't think that'll be the primary point of um, the conversation with the school committee because there's only so much data you can go through in one meeting um, uh, and, and still um, get to the dialogue you want to get to. The second part you mentioned now is lost on me, Brianna. I'm sorry. Sports. 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 So, you know, I did uh, see that uh, Williams College, Amherst College, Mount Holyoke College, Bowdoin College all have canceled sports for fall. We're not a college, we're a high school, so we're waiting on the MIAA, which is the governing agency, to make a decision. Uh, I interestingly have seen a couple other states, um, high school organizations, and I have no knowledge that this is going to happen in Massachusetts, but I, you know, become an obsessive reader about what's happening elsewhere, um, is uh, they've actually shifted the non-contact sports to fall. So uh, like tennis and golf um, and being, becoming fall sports in the hopes that a vaccine or some treatment will come and some of the contact sports like soccer, football. Um, if soccer's, some states consider soccer a contact sport, some don't, but football, I think everyone considers a contact sport. Um, and some of the other uh, higher contact sports um, could perhaps occur in spring if a vaccine's here. It's an interesting kind of model uh, maybe an optimistic model in terms of vaccine timeline, but we all need optimism these days. And um, so I, I'm still waiting on MAA. I know they have having meetings um, and I got a survey from them the other day. So they're trying to solicit input. Um, so I think with the state guidance that comes out in a couple of weeks from DESE, hopefully they have a decision because I know there's a lot of student athletes that are really anxious about what, they're both anxious on both levels. They're anxious about perhaps playing because they know their, their sport is gonna be really hard to do socially distanced. They're also anxious about what will happen to their season. If, if we don't have sports in the fall, does it mean football doesn't happen for this whole calendar year? Or is there still some hope for spring? So uh, we sort of have multiple uh, governing agencies that are going to give us that feedback. Um, but it is interesting to see some creativity that I've, um, I've witnessed from other states uh, about how they might do that. And uh, tennis and golf are the two sports that I've seen as being um, some states have felt more comfortable moving forward in fall with. But I have no knowledge of whether that will happen in Massachusetts. Great. And I think we're getting close to our time, but we have um, one more question that kind of answers some, some of the things you've been uh, speaking to today. Um, so it seems like schools are going to need a lot of work in the buildings and maybe even paying additional people. Um, where is the money going to come from? So I just bring Paul bagels all the time. <laughs> you know, he loves bagels. Um, but uh, no, on a serious note, you know, the state has provided us uh, with some additional funding. Uh, I think one of the challenges is at the state budget level, uh, at the state level, our budget's only, we only know what our budget is in the summer. Uh, there is no state budget for the next fiscal year. So we're all uh, making some assumptions. We don't know if those assumptions are accurate, if they're optimistic or they're pessimistic. And um, it's, a, it's a real challenge with budgeting. And I think uh, the town of Amherst has done a really good job of uh, making preliminary plans and knowing that we may have to have additional conversations over time. Uh, they've been a great partner to the schools in that way. 
Um, but it is, um, it, it is something that's on our mind. We're trying to be acutely aware of uh, our finances. And we also know that our community has high expectations of the education that we provide for their students. And uh, hopefully we don't get into a conflict place on where those are pitted against each other. And if that happens, what we're gonna do is what we always do, which we share transparently information we have, what we know, what we don't know, and, and have community stakeholders uh, talk about the problem, see if there's creative solutions um, and work through it. And uh, I think the big thing uh, that I feel confident about is our school committee um, is dedicated to our students and dedicated to being good stewards of finances and dedicated to working with the towns, uh, town of Amherst, town of Pelham and, and Shootsbury and Leverett as well uh, to update them throughout about the situation. But you know, the last couple of years, even in some tough budget years, we've been able to manage um, some deficit that, that we had at the beginning of the year where there's health insurance, um, that was a particularly acute one where we received negative health insurance, I don't know, was it a week into the fiscal year a couple of years ago, Paul, something like that. And, um, you know, we worked through it. This is a different challenge. Uh, there are more unknowns in this challenge. Uh, but, you know, we're just going to keep on talking about it and keep on making sure we're staying on top of what we're spending and what our needs are and keep on communicating that in public meetings that we'll have. Um, you know, we've already had probably more summer meetings that we typically have, uh, you know, some are usually July in particular is a slow month for school committees statewide. That's not the case this year. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we still need to, to talk about budget and where some of these cost centers are going to come from and, and what trade-offs we have to have. So just like on that one, um, the good news is the town is in a strong financial position. We have the flexibility. We raised, we built up the reserves for a purpose not expecting to have to use it for this. We hope we still don't have to use it for this. The other piece of it is that the state ha does come th has come through in the federal government with some money. And different pots of money come in and tied up in different packages. And so we're trying to sort of place those pots of money appropriately. There's some building, there's some money that comes in that the schools cannot use for staffing, but they can use for construction. We get money. And so it's like making sure that we're maximizing the availability of funds that we get independent of the local tax dollars is really important. And I think that's, um, we're managing that on a daily basis because there's different money that comes in all the time um, in little pieces that that um, I think will help us get through this. Um, and we're, we're hoping for more, we need more. And I just wanna remind everybody too that we will have, um, we'll share all of the school's information about how to keep updated and offer your feedback throughout this. Um, additionally, the next few weeks in town, um, we will be focusing heavily on the budget. Um, next week, we will have our finance director on the call to answer questions, as well as um, we'll be trying out something new, doing a 24-hour ask me anything about budget and finance um, next Thursday as well, and we'll share out those details. So. If, this, um, if you have additional budget questions, um, please try to use that format and we will um, get you some details. So with that being said, we've, um, we're done we're, we're done with our time here today. Mm -hmm. Unless there's any last um, um, statements you guys wanna put out there. I'm good. Have a great Independence Day. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Brianna. Yeah. Have a nice day.